um, I don't think so at all. Um, you know, we're already, as I mentioned earlier, a very substantial exporter. And um, changes, like you mentioned, I think would just, for us, make qualifications more difficult and um, you know, would likely not, uh, not be beneficial. And, and all of our um, growth that we have is all on the U.S. Gulf Coast. So um, with a lot of new capacity coming online, so you know, more material that will be exported out of the U.S. So. I think I might have to go back to what Lance said um, in his remarks, the answer to a similar question, because I think um, you know, the rules of economics still do apply. Um, so does gravity. So, you know, with everything that we're seeing. So I think, um, you know, using uh, content rules as blunt force instruments to, to, to try to force companies or industries to try to manufacture in specific places, um, I think, you know, in, in, in some cases they, 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 they work. You know, you look at what China has done, or you look at, you know, what other countries have done to try to foster localization <coughs> Manufacturing in, um, in in countries, uh, you know, the large companies who are looking to uh, uh, have uh, more access to consumers in those markets. Sometimes they adapt. Sometimes sometimes they don't. Who who gets hurt are small and medium sized enterprises uh, who are not able to actually surmount those types of local content rules. Um, you know, I, I would say that it's. Um, you know, for, for the decision makers who are who are thinking about these sorts of things, the better way to increase U.S. content in in products is to make the investment climate more hospitable in the United States, and to, to deal with some of the structural issues that we have in the United States that I think um, could could increase those growth rates to where I think we would all want to see them go. Um, Carolyn. With respect to the, the slide that you put up showing the decrease in manufacturing uh, and the output and the employees, have you put that up against overall manufacturing to say, you know, so you can say if there's a mean, which direction they're going? I mean, have, have you taken a look at that yet? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question because it is showing both. Oh. Maybe I could. Um, yeah. uh, okay. The, the slide was showing both it was autos and okay. overall manufacturing. Gotcha. And I think uh, one point is they moved together. And I would say that blip in, in 2001 was not China. It was the recession. And you can see that because it hit cars super hard. And we don't import any cars from China. So. Um, so, so yeah, the China shock is a little bit in there somewhere. I think the the best economics literature shows that it accounts for about one million of those 5.6 million million jobs. So I, I think just to be careful that that decline is recessions really hit jobs hard. So you know if, if we want to keep our jobs, we we want to avoid recessions. <laughs> Our trade um, deficits go down. Do, do you think there's a tipping point at which, if there are, if the rules of origin get squeezed too tight, that the the, the companies we, we talked a little bit, I think um, Jacqueline talked about compliance with all of this and how difficult it is. That the costs for compliance become more. I mean, it's it's cheaper to pay the 2.5 percent on the auto than it is to pay 3 percent that you're going to do for compliance with all the rules. And do you think there's a tipping point? Yeah, absolutely. It's an easy business decision because. You are thinking about whether or not you want to meet a rule. Currently in autos, it's 62.5%. And this is one of the crazy demands that the administration is putting on the table of 85% plus a 50% US content requirement, which is just really out of the ballpark. Um, but then you think of a company that currently has 62.5% regional content. Now all of a sudden it has to go up to 85%. Well, if it's producing at 62.5, it must be the case that using domestic inputs instead or regional inputs instead of imported ones are more expensive, or it would have been using the domestic ones in the first place. So that's higher costs. Plus, there are all these crazy compliance costs of tracking all these things. So it increases costs in two ways. 
So at some point, you just say, oh, I'm just going to trade through the tariff. Um, because you can still sell goods, and the tariff on cars is actually only 2.5%. So once you do that, you don't have to abide by any rules of origin, and regional content is very likely to fall. So while it sounds like, oh, it'll make you know, us use more US parts, it could actually do exactly, exactly the opposite. And then just one question quickly for you, Duncan. Um, with respect to the agriculture, you talked about the tariffs that and how they will snap back to the NTR rates or the MSN rates. Um, do you see that if Canada and uh, Mexico continue to have a trade relationship in the US pulled out, how do you see that that impacts the US ag industry, particularly in both those markets? So, I mean, I uh what we're seeing already in Mexico is that they're, they're looking for these, these other sources, right? So they're looking at Argentina and Brazil as sources, sources for grain. Of course, Brazil also has a, uh, a large pork industry. You've got uh, uh, you know, Mexican negotiators out there uh, sort of around the world right now looking at where they can get other, uh, those same kind of goods from at a potentially lower cost afterwards. Uh, so the United States agricultural sector will be impacted, will be hit hard. That's why you've seen people like Senator Grassley coming out from Iowa and saying, oh my God, I've just realized NAFTA matters. I've just realized that Mexico is our friend. And yeah, I probably need to go out there. I think there's something fascinating going on though as well, because these are obviously a lot of the areas that were the staunchest, most diehard supporters of uh, President Trump. And they continue to be so because they, those same people haven't actually made the connection yet. Although they, they sell their corn and their corn goes to Mexico, they sell it to a big US firm like ADM, for example, and, or ConAgra, and they then sell it on to Mexico. So they think they're selling to an American company, which they are, the American company then, then sells on. So when it becomes home, and that's why I mentioned that, that, that example of the, of the screen on the tractor, that's where you're actually going to begin to see uh, the, the, the impact is that when commodity prices begin to collapse, I'll give you another couple of examples. Um, Lance earlier on talked about uh, 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 Corona beer. Um, it's interesting enough, it's, it's not just a case of sort of integrated supply chains because of the recycling that happens. The malt that goes into Mexican beer comes from the United States. You know, this is, this is a classic American story. Mexico imports that malt to make beer and then exports beer to the United States and everybody's happy. Um, you know, a, a, another example for you, uh, you know, uh, the Alpha, which is one of the Mexico's largest uh, multinational companies. Uh, one of their uh, divisions is called Sigma. It's a food company. They import 80% of their meat for their delicatessen products from the United States. They're already out there talking to the Brazilians, the Chileans, Europeans about getting their meat from somewhere else. That's what's going to happen. It's that these advantages which are there, which it's, you don't have to think about in North America, because you say, well, I get this stuff at a great price from American friends at zero tariff. Why would I look elsewhere? And now we're looking elsewhere. I will open it up for questions. We will pass the microphone in rounds before and ask folks again to identify themselves and to raise your question in the form of a question. Please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ryan Hill from Amgen. We manufacture our uh, biotech products in the U.S. and export around the world. So trade is important to us. Um, thank you very much. NAFTA is important to us. Um, when the first uh, round happened, we were very into modernizing the agreement, especially intellectual property. The second round, we wanted to modernize. After the fourth round, I'm really worried about it. I mean, it was, it was a bad round. There was a lot of disagreement. Um, Oaxaca was sort of, um, he'll take it, he'll keep negotiating. Kenyan trade minister was unhappy in three different languages. Like it was, it was, it was good. Uh, so I'm wondering, like I'm starting to think about telling my company how we tell our company about how it's going to affect our supply, supply chain. Do we need to move things around? Do we need to change things? Like, so for down the line, how are you telling your companies that you might need to change your supply chains if there is no NAFTA in the next six months? Um, we're suddenly trying to educate our employees on the importance of trade. How are you telling your employees that trade is important to your company? I um, mean, are you sitting down with union leaders every six months? Are you sending a little note with a Christmas bonus and saying, NAFTA yeah, is important? Uh, I mean, how are you talking about your supply chain and, and expressing this to your employees? Yeah, I, I can 
can make just a couple of comments. I mean, for us, it's really tough because, you know, like I mentioned, our manufacturing capacity and capability and it's a you know, highly asset intensive, um, uh, you know, manufacturing facilities that we have are all in the U.S. Right, so um, so it, it's a difficult one for sure. I think probably the one thing that I do see is is you know if you started talking about um, you know not having NAFTA or changing you know rules of origin significantly before you know now where we just you know automatically go to U.S. suppliers for things, um, maybe that becomes more of a question now, and you have to start thinking about that a little bit more. Um, so, but it's it's a tough question, and I can't really say exactly how we've. Um, you know, presented that to employees because it, you know, for us, we are such a U.S. based um, manufacturing. Export company. To Mexico, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 And and you know, we export to Mexico, and those customers probably then, you know, um, bring it back over, uh, back and forth. So. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think you know, I think you know, for for our industry, um, again, because uh, the the. It's less about duty rates for us than it is about the overall business climate and, and ecosystem within within NAFTA. I think you know we are we're we're looking to see what what the effects are, and I think a lot of companies and probably a lot of folks in this room are are all sort of in that mode of trying to figure out what what does what do these you know this what does this changing environment in the global trade space mean for for our companies where we have these types of Global footprints, and um, we have our consumers, you know, in 150 plus countries around the world, and we have these very complicated supply chains and manufacturing um, uh, uh, arrangements. Um, I think, um, you know, in, in terms of education, I think awareness is very important, and I think, you know, for 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 us, and, and I would presume for a lot of other companies, that's another area that I think we're thinking about. You know, how how do we make those connections better? And and, and it's not only internally in our companies, but, but also um, you know, having more of the lenses of the world out there talking about this um, in, a, in a public way with good facts and, and uh, helping, helping folks be able to, um, to, to make those connections. You know, the last thing he said about being able to connect a paycheck with, um, with, with, with the trade issues. I think you know, there, there has always been in, in global trade debates that disconnect between going and being able to, you know, as a consumer, buy, buy cheaper products or buy uh, things that maybe folks wouldn't have had access to before and, and the effects on um, the way that, the, you know, where, way employment works or the, or the effects on employment. But I think we're all going to have to do a better job, both internally within our companies as well as externally, and make it easy for people to understand. I think the problem is, like, in this room, we're probably all preaching to the choir here with, with with what we're talking about, but it's it's about what's happening outside, what's outside of Washington and outside mm -hmm. of the policy debates where folks may not necessarily be in the details and understand these charts or or understand how they how they really affect them. And I think that that's going to be important for all of us to understand and figure out how we make those connections better. Yeah. Yeah. Just a very quick point, a, a, a few ideas. I mean, various ideas have been circulated throughout the years. One, why not put a little statement on everybody's paycheck about how much of the company's profits come from uh, they come from Mexico or Canada or wherever, or, 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 or global trade, let's face it. Second one, that could happen on the W2. The third thing, <laughs> third thing, there was a very interesting little social experiment you may have seen on uh, Facebook recently, where a German supermarket took out all the imported goods from the supermarket, and customers came in and were horribly bewildered about what they saw, because they saw empty shelves. And of course, it was just a way of showing how we depend upon global trade today in a way that actually hits people where they really do care, which is actually in their consumption habits. And that's something which we've never been, uh, not, we've never been able to crack in this country, is how do we actually unite consumers behind the NAFTA or the trade cause? Because let's face it, it's consumers that benefit from all of this. And in turn, you know, thanks to a, a study we did at the, the Wilson Center recently, you know, a lot of the job creation from trade with Mexico is actually by freeing up income. If you save $100 on a washing machine that was made in Mexico, you're able to spend that $100 in your local community, going out to dinner, going to the cinema, and yes, Brad Pitt gets a share of those profits, but a lot of the money stays in your local community, and that creates jobs in your local community. We have to do a much better job at telling the story 
of this rather than just using our charts. And you know, think tank is a terrible like this and because and the reason is is we want to stay in business and that's what we do. But the fact is we need a lot better stories. And I would say that all of you have good stories from your companies about this. Lance had that great story. Those are the things that actually will begin to change people's minds in the long run. Well, I heard the term, um, you know, we need to show the facts and present that. I'm not sure that the facts work in this, in the current environment in which we are, and that there is a narrative that is believed, and so whether or not we can convince and influence the narrative is, is, is more what I think we have to get. Um, hold on. Steve? Discussions. And I've been attending the discussion for some time. And sometimes I think they're la-la land. No one is going to make an argument that NAFTA is not in the interest of the United States. We are dealing with what I call the chief negotiator. He loves negotiating. I'm from New York. He likes negotiating more than I do. He has read the tea leaves very simply. And he said, you know, Mexico needs this agreement more than we do. If Mexico leaves this agreement, forget the PRI, forget the conservatives. I mean, it's fine. I mean, are they going to have the guts to leave the agreement? So he puts up various issues. I'm going to make it a question because that's what Ken asked you to do. My question to you is, what do you think, what do you see in the landing zones? Where do you think the compromise is going to be made where Mexico, where Trump is able to say, hey, I've gotten enough in this agreement, so I have a good feeling. For example, would the world end if we got rid of Article 19? No one wants to get rid of Article 19. I don't want to get rid of Article 19. But if you paid the price and got rid of Article 19, so my question to you all from where you're sitting, and if somebody calls you and says, okay, we're going to come to a deal where we have to have some victories for the old man up there, and so what do you offer on the table? Because I think that's the real discussion. Thank you very much, because I learned a hell of a lot from all the service stuff and so on, and they're very good arguments for us. Thank you. Well, the way I'd answer that your question, which is, I think, the, the critical question, is um, is one piece, is adding a piece that we haven't yet talked about, which is Congress, right? So any agreement that's negotiated out of this, whatever's happening right now, would have to pass Congress and needs to be consistent with, with um, trade promotion authority. And Congress, which has the enumerated authority under the US Constitution um, to negotiate trade agreements, has laid out very specifically what it needs to see in an agreement in order for it to be consistent with those negotiating objectives. So, so your question, um, and, and I don't know what the answer is, but, but I do know that there's whatever, if, if, if there is that landing zone, it's got to be in that delta. So it has to be in the delta where the president can, can um, I think, um, uh, have a victory and say that he's gotten a better deal for, for NAFTA, but also one that can, that can, pass, that can pass Congress. I mean, that's more than an audience of one. <laughs> you know, um, one thing I find interesting is from being on several of these panels and talking to people is that the trade watching community is extraordinarily worried about this, where I find that companies are a bit more optimistic that all the checks and balances and, and everything will, will work and that and even are still talking about modernizing NAFTA, which I actually always find encouraging because they're probably talking to higher level people than I am. Um, but you know, the way I look at it is nothing good can come out of this NAFTA negotiation, renegotiation, because of this focus on the trade deficit up front. And, and when you look at um, agreements that have been negotiated, only four have been negotiated in less than a year. These were all template agreements. They were agreements where it was like a lease, signed on the dotted line. And they were Bahrain, Jordan, Oman, and DR signing on to CAFTA late. So we're talking about renegotiating and modernizing the most controversial trade agreement in US history in a matter of months. It's just not going to happen. So then I think
think you get to this point where it's either maybe it goes off quietly into the night, kind of like TTIP has done for a while. And that might be okay. There's this added uncertainty now where people don't want to invest in Mexico because we don't know what's going to happen. So it's still not good, but it's okay. I think the alternative is they go towards some sort of managed trade agreement where they get Canada and Mexico to agree. It's Lighthizer did it in the 80s. He was responsible in part for the voluntary export restraints with um, Japan. Ross did it on sugar already. As I mentioned, this is all about the trade deficit, it's all about Mexico, and it's all about cars, or vehicles, I should say, because trucks are important too. So then it becomes a managed trade agreement on autos. Will they find something, This the industry, because now they're negotiating against Canada, against Mexico, and against US industry. Will they find something that all of them can agree to? I think that would be one way out. But otherwise, I see it going quietly into the night, or perhaps Mexico walking, because at some point, they just need to do it, uh, potentially, to get reelected and stick it to the US. So I, I think there's, it's a very dangerous point we're in on NAFTA, but I just see no optimistic way towards modernization. I'm not going to add anything to this one. I'm not as uh, engaged in some of the uh, details of the negotiation steps, so I'll pass to my uh, colleague here. I, I found it um, extraordinary the other day when the negotiators, the Mexican Canadian negotiators, came out in the uh, the talks, and uh, and, uh, and one of them said, "Look, I haven't been spoken to that way since I was a child. Um, you know that they're disappointed in me, um, and uh, you know that uh, that I'm reticent. I'm sorry, I'm reluctant to resistant." Is the word to change? Uh, then one of the other negotiators said, uh, uh, "It's disconcerting when you sit across the table at trade negotiations with from somebody who doesn't believe in free trade. It's a bit like having a conversation with a member of the Flat Earth Society." <laughs> the breach between the negotiators is very real. Your question, so how do we get to yes, is a very important one. And the first thing is, I'm not sure that the end goal for the United States is yes. I think that, but let's say, let's say that it is, okay? Then I think that there are compromises that can be made on a whole bunch of things, which have already been made in, in some cases. I mean, on, on environment and labor, yes, absolutely, we can go with that. There's the modernization, there's the SME chapter, which is already completed, competitiveness, all these things which have been done. On the sunset clause, that is a red line issue, but there may be a way out. The sunset clause is, uh, what if we change that to a review every five years? That's something. If, if that was put forward by the American team, I'm pretty sure the Canadians and the Mexicans would jump on it. On rules of origin, we know, because people have, the auto industry has already spoken on this, they can probably go to 68% regional content. Okay? They're not going to go for 50% American. But they can go for that, and so Mexico and Canada will probably go on for, with, with that. So let, let's say you get to 68-70%. On that. Is that enough to satisfy Mr. Trump? I'm not sure it is. And, and Lighthizer the other day said, you know what, I, I have to bring home an, an agreement that my boss agrees with, that he likes. Because if I don't, that's the fastest way to getting fired apart from chartering a private jet. <laughs> Which I thought was, you know, humorous, but it, it reflected there was, there, there, was, there was truth in that. He knows that he does have this audience of one that you mentioned. He knows that he's got to make the president happy. But I'm not convinced that the president is going to be happy with anything. I think that, let's say they get to a, a yes, and, and Congress takes too long to approve it, Mr. Trump says, you know what? I don't like NAFTA. They're taking too long. Too long. I'm going to force the issue by withdrawing the United States. And that is a, I, I don't think Canada and Mexico are ever going to walk away. They've both pretty much said as much. Um, if this goes on beyond December of next year, and we have a left-wing president in Mexico, then it becomes a possibility. 